dive into the Gospel of Luke. Um, and we've been doing that since the beginning of the year. We've had a few weeks on and off to look at Psalms and Proverbs, and we've had uh, a five-week look at Lamentations. And last week, Len got us into Luke chapter 5. He took a story Jesus calling Matthew. He wanted to disciples and then dining with sinners and, and took a look at fasting. And Len's key message from last week was that the gospel of Jesus Christ is good news of great joy for all people. I'll say that again. The gospel of Jesus Christ is good news of great joy for all people. And there's really no surprise. That's a pretty consistent and great theme that also plays out in the two stories we're going to look at today in Luke chapter 6. Um, as we take a look at Luke's wonderful account of Jesus' ministry, I really, I really like reading through Luke on this. And Len talked a little bit about a, a number of weeks ago about stories that are, are embedded in Luke and the story of Jesus' ministry, right? And I put air quotes around the word story because to swipe from Len, uh, how well, to my mind, he captured the Bible narrative of the story of Jesus' ministry that Luke brings to life. I really love the reference to the story. He likened it to a movie. Right? It's something that you can close your eyes and almost imagine these acts playing out and the scenes playing out in your own mind. And that's how I envision these stories of Jesus ever since I was a little boy and even today. So probably a little bit more intro than you've expected, but wanted to spend a little time just to level set the group on where we've been, Luke, and get us ready for the two stories in our text, which we get at today. Six verses one through 11, which will be up on the screen. I invite you, if you have your Bibles in front of you, to to take them out and follow along because we'll be going a little bit back and forth in there. And because of the nature of the two stories today, they're really interrelated, but I wanted to break the, the text in the bits. So we're going to do verses 1 through 5 and then talk about those, and then we'll come back with verses 6 through 11 and talk about those, and then hopefully bring it all together at the end. Sound good? All right. So pray with me first, and then we'll get at it. Dear Heavenly Father, your word is powerful. Your word is true. And all things began prior to creation and is still today. May we feel that. We pray that your Holy Spirit move in us this morning to guide my words and open all our hearts and minds to better understand your will and these amazing stories in Jesus' ministry. And Father, I pray the words of the psalmist, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and redeemer. Amen. So from Luke 6, verses 1 through 5. On a Sabbath, while he, Jesus, was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, Have you not read what they did? And he was hungry, he and those who were with him. How he entered the house of God and took and ate the presence which was not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those with him. And he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Praise God for his word. Amen? Amen. So let's jump right in. Let's take a look at what's going on here in verse are on the move, right? We've talked about Luke talking about the ministry of Jesus. So this is not a ministry that sits in a place and people come to it. This is a ministry that goes, right? So they are moving from place to place, from city to city, from synagogue to synagogue. They are, they are on the move. He's in the midst. Jesus is in the midst of his earthly ministry. He's called his disciples, and they're going, teaching, preaching, and healing. Now, in the first century, travel was a chore. Most of that travel was foot travel, especially for Jesus and his disciples. And in the first century... Like we travel today, right? We just went on a travel trip last weekend. We travel today. There's no throughway rest areas back in Jesus' time. There's, there's nothing to accommodate the needs of the traveler. There's no coolers that you could pack with drinks and snacks. There's no fast food restaurants, right? To have a quick bite to eat as we have today. So for a moment, imagine Jesus and a group of men, all whom recently, by the way, just about who they were, what they had to follow Jesus, Traveling from city to city, from place to place, human needs for food and water would have been an absolute natural occurrence. And it's something we can relate to when we travel. Only today we have many ways and conveniences to satisfy our needs some 2,000 years later. 
But that was not so for Jesus and his disciples. So here's my picture. We've got a group of men who are traveling, who are hungry. All right, put a pin in that. Hang to that thought for a moment. So in verse 1, while they are traveling through grain fields, we're told his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. I'm not a farmer, so I don't really know what that all means, but that's a way that they were able to get food. Seemingly harmless, right? But wait. One important point that I I skimmed past there, the verse 1 begins with the words, on a Sabbath. On a Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain rubbing them in their hands. So you get the picture? Is your movie de- developing in your own imagination? Mine is. So I close my eyes and I see this dusty road and I see a blue sky and a hot sun and I see these, these 13 men uh, who are tired and they're, they're moving from place to place and they're hungry and there's grain alongside the, the field and they stop and they rub the heads of the grain in their hands to, to eat, to, to cure that need for, for food. And then the conflict enters, right? My scene widens out, and all of a sudden the Pharisees enter the scene. The antagonist in the story. The Pharisees who immediately challenge the disciples by asking in verse 2, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? The Pharisees. We've talked a little bit about them since we've gotten into Luke. And, but who were these folks? That's a, that's a whole sermon all by itself, I'll tell you. There's a big rabbit hole of research you could run down to, to get yourself what's going on with Pharisees. And that's not our focus today, but I thought a small background on who they were and what they were and how they were could provide some context on the verses we focus on today. And one particular definition which I came across says this, the name Pharisee literally means separated one. The Pharisees separated themselves from society to study and teach the law. But they also separated themselves from the common people because they considered the common people to be religiously unclean. In New Testament times, the Pharisees formed the largest and most influential religious political party, and they're consistently depicted in the Gospels as antagonists or opponents of Jesus Christ in the early church. Now, the Pharisees were extremely accurate and detail-oriented in all matters pertaining to the law of Moses, and while they were sound in their professions and creeds, their system of religion was more about outward form, more about outward form than genuine faith. It was a legalism. They made rules around sin in an attempt to be holier than God's word requires. And Len said this last week. The other thing Len said, which I really love, is he added on to that, just call it man-made mumbo-jumbo. So i got to tell you, as I was preparing for this, I was thinking what eloquent words I use to describe what, what the Pharisees' legal system was all about and i i really struggle with it and if i didn't know that mumbo jumbo would have you know satisfied that you know looking into specific words i would have stopped there uh really love man mumbo jumbo now jesus gets after this outward form of religion which the pharisees were out really strongly in luke 11 but that's for another day but suffice to say for the purpose of what we're looking at today the pharisees once again fill the role of antagonistic observer And Len, I stole that one from you too, because it's a really good one. Antagonistic observer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They weren't following Jesus in his ministry to ponder his teachings, to hear him speak, to see the miracles that he was doing, to watch him interact with those around him. They weren't doing that. No, they were looking for the gotcha moment with Jesus. They were looking for Jesus to stumble, to trip him up with questions if they could, to confront him with their knowledge and belief of what the rules were, which they declared, and test our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Truly antagonistic, which is their MO throughout the Gospels, right? We, we saw last week they complained when Jesus was hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. Uh, they were shocked when Jesus told a paralyzed man his sins were forgiven, where only God can forgive sins. They accused Jesus of driving out demons by the power of the prince of demons. The Pharisees also accused Jesus of letting a sinful woman touch him. They challenged Jesus to provide a sign from heaven to convince them of his authority. You know, and the Pharisees ultimately plotted, right? But needed a scheme so that they couldn't be blamed in that. 
And today in our text, we see they're coming after Jesus for acts done by his disciples in their minds, inappropriately on the Sabbath day. Let's talk about that for just a minute. In Jewish legal tradition, a tradition which is well endorsed and proclaimed, there were 39 categories of activities forbidden on the Sabbath. That's a long list. And at the time, a super serious list, because here's why. Under the Pharisees' rules, performing these activities on the Sabbath was punishable by death. To be taken trivially. Harvesting was one of the categories of activities that was considered forbidden on the Sabbath. The teachers of the law went so far as to describe different methods of harvesting. One accepted method was to rub the heads of grain between the hands, just as the disciples were doing here. An accepted method. God's law instructed farmers to leave the edges of their fields unplowed so travelers and the poor could eat from this bounty, from Deuteronomy 23. So the disciples were, in fact, not guilty of stealing any grain because the Lord said you should have that there for, for travelers and the poor. Not guilty of God's law, even if they may have been violating the Pharisees' rules relating to the Sabbath and the Pharisees' minds, but they weren't even doing that. One of the accepted methods of harvesting was exactly as I said what the disciples were doing. If I was an attorney, and I'm not, this might be the summation of my legal facts to the jury or the judge hands them the case for deliberation. Put a pin in this for now. This is my legal summary of where we're at. Notice in verse 3, Jesus responds. Jesus responds to the Pharisees, and he says, And Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those with him. So Jesus here is referring to the story of David fleeing from Saul from the Testament book of 1 Samuel, chapter 21. I won't read that one, but in this story, David and his men had been traveling. They were fleeing Saul. Saul wanted to kill David, so they were on the move. They'd been moving from city to city, from place to place. They were tired. There were no amenities as we have today when we travel. And folks, they were hungry. To have a group of men moving city to city, place to place, tired, hungry. Does that sound familiar? Sure it does. So they came to the temple and asked for food. The priest responded, all they had was the bread of the presence. What's the bread of the presence? Well, each week, 12 consecrated loaves of bread, representing the 12 tribes of Israel, were placed on a table in the temple. And after its use in the temple each week, it was replaced with 12 fresh loaves of bread. And the old loaves were taken away and could only be eaten by the priests. Yet with great mercy and great love, the priest gave David and his men the bread. So we notice a couple of things in Jesus that Jesus demonstrates in his response. The first, which we can learn from, especially me, is that Jesus knew his scripture. As you know, he does this a lot. And we're intentional each week at the end of each service as we recite together various scripture passages. We do this to write the word of God in our hearts and our minds to reflect on it, but as important to use it when we're confronted. And we say it time and time again, but the answers we seek in our day-to-day -day lives to this, that, and the other thing, they're right in here, folks. Right? All right in here. And here Jesus gives a beautiful demonstration of this. Secondly, Jesus does not enter into the legal debate that I just put forth with the Pharisees on the acts of the disciples. He doesn't engage in a legal discussion over differences in law and the Pharisees' legal tradition. You know, he could have referred them to the fact that they were not stealing, number one, and number two, that the method they used to gather the grain was actually acceptable under Pharisee law. So, in fact, no sin whatsoever was being committed. Rather, Jesus refers the Pharisees and those around to the well-known story of David when fleeing from Saul. And Jesus asks the Pharisees, have you not read what David did? Have you not read what David did? A completely rhetorical question. Here's why. Me referring to this story as well-known at the time doesn't do justice to the phrase known, folks. 
You see, to the Pharisees, King David was a significant Old Testament hero. He would have been the it guy to them, a king of kings, a significant person from the Old Testament who they would have revered, their hero. So yeah, the Pharisees read what David did. They read it. They'd studied it. They most likely had it memorized. And imagine that this would have cut them to the quick. Maybe you shut them right down. In fact, in Luke's account, there's no other dialogue from the Pharisees after Jesus hands in this rhetorical question. And the same goes true for Matthew's and Mark's account of the story. There's no response from the Pharisees to Jesus' question. And Jesus is, is, is brilliant. He's using the story of David to illustrate to the Pharisees and to those around and to us today, David's need was more important than ceremonial regulations. That the meeting of the human need was greater than following the human law put in place. The mumbo-jumbo. Jesus is pointing out David's authority at that time to take the consecrated bread based on his Davidic kingship. And Jesus is drawing it out and pointing it forward to Jesus' authority over all things, including the Sabbath. The notion of if the great David was allowed to eat of the holy bread, how much more the Son of Man. You know, I love Mark's account of the story from Mark 2.27. Jesus says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Big amen for that. And if Jesus' response to what the Pharisees were alleging and his rhetorical question weren't enough, he adds on in verse 5, and he said to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Wow. Mind blown. You know, just to make certain the Pharisees are not unclear in any way as to the analogy Jesus makes by referring to the story of David, Jesus makes a profound and powerful proclamation. He asserts here that he is God. And as such, all power and authority over all things is his. Let me say that again. All power and authority over all things is his, including the Sabbath. Jesus is the new king, the new David. All of the law points to Jesus, servant to the Sabbath. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. What a wonderful proclamation for us today, which we can lean into and count on and trust. Let's go to the second half of our text, verses 6 through 11. On another Sabbath, he entered, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. The man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath, so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man with the withered hand, Come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? And after looking at them all, he said, to him, stretch out your hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored. But they, the Pharisees, were filled with fury and discussed with one another what to do to Jesus. Praise God again for his word. Amen. Amen. So the second part of our text begins similarly to the first part in verse 1. They say, on another Sabbath, we see in, in verse 6, into the story while Jesus is in the synagogue, and teaching, and there was a man there whose hand was withered. I think like that is a paralysis of the hand, right? Shrunken sinew, atrophy of the muscles in the hand, dry, withered skin. We see in verse 7 that the scribes and Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. You know, in earlier confrontations with Jesus and his ministry, the Pharisees, they asked Jesus questions directly of him trying to catch him. Whereas in the story we just went through, the Pharisees question or raise allegations concerning Jesus' disciples. We hear the Pharisees decide to simply keep quiet in the hope of catching Jesus doing something to violate Pharisee law concerning the Sabbath. i got to tell you, I love the start of verse 8. But he knew their thoughts. And so it didn't matter. Whether the Pharisees tried to trick him with questions, or remain silent with thoughts of the gotcha moment they were looking for, Jesus was ready for them. 
And as an aside, he's still ready, folks. He's alongside us, knowing our thoughts, desiring relationship with us, knowing what we ask for in prayer before we even speak it. How awesome is that, right? Jesus knows our every thought. That's just an aside, the little extra for today. So knowing their thoughts, Jesus says to the man with the withered hand, come and stand here, which he did. Then he asked the Pharisees in verse 9, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? And similar to our first today, silence. No response from the Pharisees. You know, honestly, I imagine they were shaken up a bit. How does he know what were the jumble rules that the Pharisees had in place? Luke tells us in verse 10 that Jesus then scanned the room. Right After looking around at them all, most likely, I think, I imagine, looking to make eye contact with the Pharisees. You know, or maybe hopeful to hear at least one of them acknowledge that he is the Christ. I can imagine that Jesus may have been saddened or disheartened by there not being a response. Luke doesn't say, this is what I imagine in my, my movie, my imagination of, of what this looks like. You know, the Pharisees, they couldn't see past the first six words of Jesus' question. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to even consider or respond to the heart of the matter that Jesus was asking, which is whether to do good or harm, to save life or destroy it? They couldn't see past those first six words. So Jesus then tells the man in verse 10, stretch out your hand, and he did so. And his hand was restored, partially restored, somewhat restored, fully restored. His hand was fully restored. And this is where I have to caution myself as I'm for a few weeks to not get swept up in the miracle alone. But it's easy to do, right? How amazing. So while the caution is don't get swept up in the, the miraculous act or the miracle alone, folks, I'm here to tell you, get swept up in the miracle, right? Our Jesus is all-powerful. He reigns over all, still in the miracle business today. You better believe he is. Amen? Amen. Now, to be clear, also note that Jesus doesn't do any labor or work on the Sabbath, as the Pharisees were hoping to see. You know, not in the human sense. That is, Jesus did heal the man's hand. That required energy, I imagine. But this is a divine energy, and it's energy we don't understand, and we won't on this side of heaven. Jesus' actions here would not have violated any ceremonial law regarding touching the man because he didn't. The text is clear. He did not touch the man. He simply asked the man with a bad hand to stretch it out. But in spite of the fact that Jesus violated no divine law, no Pharisee rules regarding the Sabbath, the Pharisees still did not see. They shut out Jesus again. Their deliverer, their Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, the Lord of the Sabbath, the King of Kings, sitting right in front of them, teaching, healing, preaching, they still can't see it. You know, rather, as Luke tells us in verse 11, what did the Pharisees do? They were filled with fury and discussed what they might do to Jesus. Matthew's and Mark's account of the story used the words conspired on how to destroy him. That was the Pharisees' response. That was the Pharisees' response. So what can we learn from these two amazingly impactful stories of Jesus' ministry? How do we put this on in our lives? Well, as we get into that, it wouldn't be fitting to spend time in these two stories on Jesus' ministry without, with Sabbath day implications without taking a look, as we've done earlier in our call to confession, Exodus 20 through 11. Again, but it's up here. How wonderful. We put this service together and without sitting around each other, and that's our call to confession, and here it is right here. So there's, there's something else happening here. But that's, that's God's law on the Sabbath. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the Jesus' ministry regarding the Sabbath day. We have Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11, which we've gone through, which is the fourth commandment. And we also have historical, theological statements deep theological statements from confessions which are part of the Reformed Christian faith with specific views on the Sabbath. Now that's a deep dive. But one of them that I thought was really specific and appropriate comes from the Heidelberg Catechism, and I'll read it to you really quickly, and it's Q&A. 
response to the question of what does God require in the fourth commandment? It's a pretty straightforward question. And one of the responses in part says, first, that the ministry of the gospel and the schools be maintained. And that I, meaning we, especially on the Sabbath, that is, on the day of rest, diligently frequent the church of God to hear his word, to use the sacraments, and to publicly call upon the Lord. Real specific. So where do we go from here? What's our take-home, Pat? We've been up here for 25 minutes, and what are we going to take home with us from what you've, 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 you've taught on here today? You know, I, gotta, I would love to have a specific, detailed, circumstance-specific flowchart of the nuances, of the, the alternates, of the situations, specific potential occurrence that might present itself to a follower of Christ as it relates to the Sabbath. And then how to respond and act in those circumstances. So I'm a process guy, so I have a flow chart and I think of decision boxes and arrows, yes, no, and you kind of follow it along. Don't you have one of those for us, Pat? We'd really like one of those. Uh, truth is, I don't. But what I do have is this. And that is simply repeat what Jesus proclaimed to the Pharisees, that the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. You know, my time up here today is not all about getting into the 39 forbidden activities or the Pharisees' rules relating to the Sabbath or the bits and bites of the historical confessions, but rather I think one of the significant implications and point of emphasis that we find in our text today is our constant reminder that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. And that deserves our attention and our reverence, our energy and our action to set time aside to dutifully worship our God. You know, rather than a focus on the what you should not do, rather focus of what we should do, and that is worship our God. Because if Jesus is truly Lord of your lives, he is then worthy of a faithful life of worship. I'll say that one again. If Jesus is truly Lord of your lives, he is then worthy of a faithful life of worship. I know what you're thinking, because I'd be thinking if I was sitting where you're sitting, Pat, we got that. That's why we're here, man. Right? You're preaching to the choir, Pat. And I can understand and appreciate that. So here's what I would say to you then. If you get that and you have a faithful life of worship, make it a priority to tell someone else. Encourage each other in this, especially those church fam folks, those brothers and sisters who are here and those who are not. Tell others why you make the Sabbath a special day, a day to set aside the activities of the world, man's the week, the pressures of your lives, and worship God, His Son, Jesus Christ, the King of kings, and take rest in Him. Share with someone else your grace story. I've set it up here every time I've been up here. So I feel it's really important. Share your grace story with someone. How The way that plays out is that God gives you grace freely, and that you praise and worship Him for that grace. Specific time set aside. Let others know how vitally important, proper, Mindful remembrance of the Sabbath day is to relationship with Jesus. So that's one takeaway. Here's another. And specifically looking at Jesus' interaction with the Pharisees, I am astounded by the patience and love that he shows. I don't know about you, but I am. As I already mentioned, Jesus' line of questioning of the Pharisees in response to outward allegations made against him or his disciples or even their thoughts and hoping to trip Jesus up to me I also see as an invitation for the Pharisees to see Jesus for who he truly is. When Jesus asked the Pharisees if they remember the story of what David did when he was hungry, I imagine that he may have been trying to open their eyes, open their hearts and their minds to the fact that Jesus is the new king, the new authority for the Sabbath. And sitting right before them was the Son of God, their Lord and Savior, if they would only have him. He gave them an opportunity to respond before he, he proclaimed to them who he was, in fact. And similarly, in the second half of what we looked at today, he gave the Pharisees the opportunity to respond to his even more simple question, whether to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, whether to save life or destroy it. Their hearts, though, were hardened. You know, in each instance, Jesus is calling to those around him to come to him, to see him for who he is, to see Jesus for who he is. In spite of direct allegations, in evil thoughts, Jesus calls on them to see him for who he truly is, the promised Christ, the king of all kings. And folks, Jesus still does this today. 
You know, in our mission as a church to bring the gospel to every man, woman, and child in the community, desire to let others know who Jesus truly is, to draw them out, if you will, right? As Christ's people, we are empowered, equipped by the Holy Spirit to take that same message, to share the gospel and tell others who Jesus truly is, is that Jesus is Lord. You know, my prayer today is that if you've not done so in your life, that in addition to finding rest in Jesus, that it's just and appropriate due, that you would also see Jesus today for who he truly is, the promised Christ, the King of kings, the one to whom all authority in heaven and on earth has been given, the Lord of the Sabbath. Amen? Amen. Amen. Pray with me. Who is the authority over all things? We pray that uh, as we go from here today, that we are mindful, respectful, and dutifully worship you at all times and in all places. And that we share that love of worship for you with others and let be to draw them to you. May the Holy Spirit make this so for us, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.